Thank you, Mark. The Texas Book Festival is pleased to partner with the LBJ Foundation and Library to bring you tonight's conversation, which I consider a continuation of last weekend's celebration of books, featuring one of our 2024 festival authors, Jean Baker. Jean served in the East Wing of the George H.W. Bush White House and went on to become Chief of Staff for former President Bush for over 25 years. She's the co-founder of Civil Dialogues, a partnership to create a safe space for constructive civil conversation on some of the most important contentious topics of the day, and author of the New York Times bestseller, The Man I Knew, The Amazing Story of George H.W. Bush's Post-Presidency. Tonight, our conversation will focus on her most recent book, Character Matters, and other life's lessons and Other Life Lessons from George H.W. Bush, a compilation of stories from colleagues, family members, and friends on our 41st President's Leadership and Legacy. David Bates was George W. Bush's personal aide from 1978 to 1981 and served in a variety of roles during Bush's years as Vice President, uh, Secretary to the Cabinet, and finally Bush's President Bush's uh, Deputy Chief of Staff. He's now the CEO of his own consulting company. The Honorable Joe Strauss III served in the Commerce Department during President Bush's tenure before returning to Texas. Strauss was elected to seven terms in the Texas House of Representatives, including five terms as Speaker of our great state from 09 to 19. He's now Principal at Lasima Partners, LLC. The conversation will be moderated by Dr. Mark Lawrence, Professor of History and Walter Prescott Webb, Chair in History and Ideas at the University of Texas at Austin and the former director of the LBJ Library. Please join me in welcoming Jean, Baker, Jean Becker to the stage. Thank you, Marianne. That was such a gracious introduction, but I do have a bone to pick with you. I was honored to be an author at the Texas Book Festival, but I was competing with Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, anyway, uh, before we get to our panel discussion, I'm so honored that David Bates and Joe Strauss drove over from San Antonio to join me. I'm very grateful to them. But I just want to talk a little bit about why I wrote Character Matters. I actually wrote a book about President Bush, um, The Man I Knew. This is what I did during the pandemic. And this was, I stayed in my pajamas for six months and wrote this book. And it did really well. It was on the New York Times bestseller list. So I was having lunch with my editor a couple years ago. And he asked me to write another book about President Bush. And I looked at him sort of oddly, and I said, you do remember that he died at the end of the last book. I, I couldn't figure out where he was going with this. But I mean, I wasn't hearing from him from above. But as he said to me, President Bush truly left as a blueprint on how to live a life well lived. And he said, I just think there is so much more we can learn from him. And so after sleeping on it for a couple of days, out of that conversation came this book, Character Matters. And what the book is, it's a compilation of essays. I reached out to the people who knew him best and asked them to send me a story or an example of something they learned from them, him. And I was hoping for 50 or 60, there's 154 people in this book. And it's everybody from John Major and Brian Mulroney, former prime ministers of the UK and, and Canada, uh, Reba McIntyre and Dana Carvey, Andy Card, Bob Gates, Condi Rice, Secretary Baker, Dan Quayle, the young man who mowed the yard at Walker's Point in Kennebunkport, and David Bates and Joe Strauss, which is part of why they're here today. But one of the things I wanted to talk about is, in, in setting up our discussion, is that there's probably no better example of President Bush's, he truly had a servant's heart. 
And there's probably no better example of that than his relationship with this man. George Bush and Bill Clinton became best friends. And most of you remember the 1992 election. It maybe wasn't as nasty as the last one or the one before that, but it was tough. And they became best friends. They're on the beach in Galveston. This is Galveston, Texas. This is after Hurricane Ike. And many of you probably recognize Secretary Baker. They dragged poor Secretary Baker into their, their disaster fundraising. The two of them raised about a half a billion dollars for disaster relief in this country. They, whenever there was a hurricane, they would just roll up their sleeves and, and go to work. A few years ago, Hurricane Harvey dumped 50 inches of rain on Houston, Texas in 48 hours. And most of you probably know that Houston was completely underwater. And so the two George Bushes, 41 and 43, were gonna go to work. They were gonna do their own Harvey disaster fund. But I started getting phone calls from my fellow chief of staffs. All the former presidents wanted to join in. And they, it was wonderful. They raised about $50 million for Hurricane Harvey victims. And we were gonna do this little event at that other university over there. I think it's called A&M. A and M, that's it. President, we were gonna host an event. I think Larry Gatlin and the Gatlin brothers were coming. We were gonna be in a tent. We were gonna have a barbecue. We were gonna raise a little money. And then President Obama's chief of staff called me and said he would like to come. And by the way, he can bring Lady Gaga. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> We moved it from a tent to Rita Rita, where the Aggies played basketball. And then President Clinton's chief of staff called and said, if you think he's going to let Barack Obama go to Texas to hang out with the Bush boys without him, you got to be, no, he's coming. He's coming from Germany. And then I called President Carter's chief of staff, and she said, oh, he'll want to come. So this is all five former presidents. Can I just tell you to please ignore the woman in the back of this photo? <laughs> I don't know who she is. Uh, she looks a lot like me. I need to cut her out. I will tell you, I showed this photo at an event last week, and I was wearing that exact same outfit. <laughs> that makes it harder to explain. Um, so this was backstage at Reed Arena before the five presidents were introduced on. And just a couple of funny things first. When I told the Bushes that everybody was coming, every former president was coming, President Bush cried. He was so touched. Mrs. Bush asked me if she had to give them dinner. <laughs> I said, yes, you do. The other funny thing that I love about this photo, and then we'll get serious for a moment, when a lot of times people would ask President Bush, why are you such good friends with Bill Clinton? What, you know, what do you two have in common? And he would say, look, I'm old. I've run out of things to say. And I, when I'm with Bill, I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I want you to look at who's doing the talking in this photo. <laughs> and you know, whatever the story is, it must be a good one. Um, I love showing this photo, though. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how it used to be. This is what we need to get back to. We need to work at this. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is, I have one more disaster story before we bring up the guys. Um, what most, when I tell this story anywhere outside of Texas, I have to explain Hurricane Rita. No one outside of Texas, most of you might remember that a week after Katrina, another hurricane called Rita came ashore west of New Orleans, pretty well chewed up what was left of the Louisiana coastline and also did some pretty heavy damage around Beaumont and that part of Texas. None of the victims of Rita were getting any help at all. Everybody was in New Orleans, the media, celebrities. You know, obviously FEMA was helping. I mean, everybody was just overwhelmed by this second hurricane on the heels of the catastrophic Katrina. So this wonderful man named Richard Sluschloss cold called our office 
and he was from a little town called Cameron, Louisiana, and it had pretty well been leveled, and he wanted to know, including their hospital, and he wanted to know if President Bush could help raise money so they could at least build an emergency room. He said, we have no health care in Cameron, and no one's going to start rebuilding or moving back until they have health care. So President Bush said, of course, and he raised $3 million in a short amount of time, and we were going to Cameron with $3 million the week before Christmas to break ground for the new emergency room. The governor was coming, and I'd lined up the high school band was going to march. It was going to be a lovely little event and break ground. And President Bush is looking at the schedule, and he said, Gene, this is a boring schedule. <laughs> These people have had a tough year. We need to do something special for them. And it's possible with attitude, I said, I think the former president coming to town with $3 million is pretty special. You know, what are you talking about? He said, I have an idea. The scariest words the man ever said to me. <laughs> he said, Barr and I have fallen in love with this new TV show. We watch it every night. We just love it. It's called ER. And there's this young actor who I think is the star, George Clooney. I'm thinking, let's get George Clooney to go to Cameron, Louisiana with us. He said, do you get it, Gene? ER? ER. <laughs> well, let me tell you what he didn't get. They're watching it in reruns on TBS. <laughs> ER is no longer on network television. And when I told him it was no longer on TV, he said, every night, Gene. <laughs> and I said, sir, George Clooney is a huge movie star. He is making all these ocean movies. He's People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive. I said, George Clooney is not coming to Cameron, Louisiana with you. We don't know him. We don't know anyone who knows him. He's not in my Rolodex. No, no, no. And I, I stormed out of his office. I was like, this is stupid. <laughs> yes, that would be George Clooney in Cameron, Louisiana. Uh, I did. <laughs> I did have the best job in America. And, pr President, and just briefly, what happened is President Bush came marching into my office. He could Google with the best of them. And the only Republican in Hollywood, I think, of his good friend, Jerry Weintraub, who was a big time Hollywood producer. Jerry Weintraub produced all the ocean movies. I had no idea. And he said, I called Weintraub, Gene. You didn't tell me he was involved. Jerry Weintraub called George Clooney. And George Clooney came. And on the plane coming home, did I go with them? Yes. <laughs> Everybody fell asleep, but, uh, but George and me, it was special. And I, I, asked him, I asked him why he came. I said, why did you do this? And this was his answer. He said, I was so touched when Weintraub called me that President Bush was raising money for a hurricane that no one had heard of that had destroyed a town that no one had heard of. And he was doing it below the radar, no press, no big deal. He said, I wanted to be a part of it. He's a good man. And yeah, he's cute. <laughs> so, okay, for some reason I feel very close to you all. I will just tell you that on the plane also coming home, little plane, little get kitchen galley, I got up to use the bathroom, TMI, but it's important to the story. I come out, and <clears throat> George is waiting in the galley, and we had to squish past each other. <laughs> it's a moment. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I love the story, but the lesson, the lesson learned from President Bush was don't be afraid to think big. You'll win some, you'll lose some. He loved quote, quoting Wayne Gretzky who once said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Um, I, can I go backwards? I think this picture was showing, this is, you have to look really hard. This is Lyndon Johnson leaving, Air, uh, leaving Andrews Air Force Base on January 20th, 1969. Republican Congressman George Bush 
skipped the inauguration of Republican President Richard Nixon, he wanted to go to Andrews to tell LBJ goodbye. He felt that's where he belonged. And LBJ saw him in the crowd, and if you look closely, you can see LBJ reaching out. You can see the two of them shaking hands. It's just to the right of the left, right of the left of the sign, we'll miss you. And LBJ never ever forgot that. My, and they stayed in touch and remained friends. My favorite story about the two of them, and I have Mark Upton Groves at permission to tell the story. President Bush is thinking, Congressman Bush is thinking about running for the Senate in 1970, and he went to the LBJ ranch to get LBJ's advice. Can you imagine that happening today? A Republican congressman going to ask a Democratic president. So he asked LBJ, should I keep my safe seat in the House or should I run for the Senate? <coughs> Excuse me. To which LBJ said, George, the difference between being in the House, the Senate in the House, is the difference between chicken salad and chicken shit. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, that is classic LBJ. <laughs> one more quick story. You really can't talk about, okay, ladies, get ready. George Clooney, one more time. <laughs> um, you really can't talk about George Bush without talking about George and Barbara Bush. This photo was taken on their 70th wedding anniversary. And I will just tell you one quick story about how smart George Bush was. One of the essays in Character Matters a young woman in our office was answering the phones at the front desk, and General Colin Powell calls. And Kara, then the second line rings, and it's Secretary James Baker. The third line rings. She can't even get in to tell President Bush all these people are calling. The third line is the governor of Texas, George W. So she's about ready to run to President Bush's office to say, oh my god, you have Colin Powell, James Baker, the governor. Who do you want first? When our fourth line, when we had four lines, rang, it was Barbara Bush. So she runs into President Bush's office, says, oh my gosh, Colin Powell, James Baker, the governor, your wife, who do you want first? And she writes that without hesitating, President Bush said, put my wife through and tell the others I'll call him back. <laughs> he was a smart man. And I hope all you husbands were paying attention to that. <laughs> So I brought some other photos of some of my panelists. This is President Bush and Joe Strauss. It's a little, this is in his Houston office, I think, Joe. It's a little fuzzy. President Bush loved both Joe and David. He wanted Joe to be President of the United States. It's not too late. Um, this is President, yeah, let's see me afterwards. Um, this is President Bush and a very young David Bates in the Oval Office. I love this picture, David. And I stuck at the end a photo of President Bush and Mark Updegrove. Where are you? Is that in his office, Mark? In, uh, uh, the apartment. Oh, that's the apartment at the library. Anyway, on that note, I would love for the panelists to come up. It's time for you to hear from them. Come on up, guys. Somebody had already done that. Wait, I screwed this up. You all need to be in charge back there. Yeah, why don't you? Yeah, you, you, you all right. Right. I'll sit on the. Yeah, you, you're in. The, you ought to be in the middle oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Moderator always sits. Yeah. You sure? Okay. I'm gonna right. sit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm gonna sit between the two of you in case Perfect. you get in a fight. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, that was an absolutely brilliant start to our night, um, and I want. <laughs> Welcome all, to the. It's all about the Clooney story. Yeah. It's a good one. It's, it's a good, a good one. one. Um, and welcome to the stage to Joe Strauss and David Bates. It's a huge honor to be up here with all three of you tonight to talk about this extraordinary president and, as we know from this book, extraordinary human being. Let's dive right in. Gene has just told us some pretty memorable stories. I'd love to hear from the two of, who have just joined us. Uh, David, I understand you have a, and I quote Gene Becker here, a fall down funny story to share with us about <laughs> President Bush. 
Um, well, thank you, and, and, it is, and it is an honor to be here, Mark. Thank you for, for having us, and Gene, great presentation. Um, that, that, that story will kind of be at the end of the, end of the story, but it, it takes place at the 1980 convention, which was a, uh, um, a, a, very, uh, um, a very memorable, very memorable one. Um, just a little prelude to that, to that convention. Um, as you recall, the 1980 Republican primary, it was a very big field, a very strong field. You had Howard Baker, who was Senate Minority Leader, John Conley had been Governor of Texas, Secretary of Treasury, Bob Dole had been the VP nominee, a couple of, couple of respected congressmen, um, and Ronald Reagan, of course, who had nearly won the, 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 the Republican nomination in 76 against the sitting president. But uh, the race quickly became a two-man race bet between Reagan and, 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 uh, and 41 and, and President Bush. And, um, but uh, finally, after, and President Bush won some big states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Connecticut, which was a swing state back then, and uh, of course the Iowa caucus, which got him started. But, but by, by, by Memorial Day, um, it became clear that, that Ronald Reagan had the required number of delegates. President Bush withdrew on Memorial Day. The convention was early that year, like mid-July, and um, we thought, well, there's a pretty good chance that he's gonna be the VP nominee. Um, it, it, it made perfectly good sense. President Bush had the, the, the foreign policy background, having been ambassador of the UN and the CIA director, and, and um, and, and our liaison to, to China. And Reagan had the strong domestic policy from being governor of California. Uh, and, uh, but, but we kind of never, we, 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 we also heard some rumors that, that maybe it's some Reagan people and maybe Mrs. Reagan thought that, that, that President Bush had stayed in the race too long. And um, so anyway, we went to the convention. There still had not, uh, still didn't know who the nominee would be. Um, and I remember we got to the, who the VP nominee would be. We, we got to the Wednesday, the third day of the convention, um, had a lunch that day. Um, and uh, that, that, I remember after the lunch, we did a couple of events and maybe went to a run and came back to the hotel about five. He was gonna be speaking at the convention later that night. Walter Cronkite was on the TV and basically saying it, it, it sounds like that Reagan's gonna pick Gerald Ford to be his VP nominee. And um, we were just kind of stunned. That was just out of the blue. And, um, but uh, anyway, we got ready. The President Bush went, got ready for his speech. We went to the convention hall. I remember we were, he was getting ready to go, you know, go, go up to this, you know, this walkway up to the podium and Jim Wooten from ABC News was there and he said, what's the latest on Reagan and, and, and Ford? And Jim Wooten said, it's, it's a done deal. Their, their Secret Service agents are coming to the um, convention later this night to, um, to uh, and they're gonna make a joint appearance and President Bush kind of shrugged his shoulders and went up and, and kind of typical of him, it was none, he gave a speech and none of it was about himself. It was all about what a good nominee uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was gonna be and what a great president he would make. And, and uh, anyway, when the speech was over, he, we walked back to our hotel, to, to our hotel and he said, y'all get some, get some beer, bring it up to the suite. We kind of thought it was all over. They kind of have a little wake. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the thing where the party broke up, I was in the room next to the suite with Jeb Bush, we were, and um, uh, after we left the suite, about 10 minutes later, it was a knock on the door and Mrs. Bush said, boys, why don't you all come on in? Uh, Jeb, come in, David, you can come in too. And uh, your dad's got something to tell you. And we, uh, uh, Jeb, and anyway, we walked in and he said, Ronald Reagan just called me, asked me to be the VP nominee. Mm -hmm. And um, about 45 seconds, the uh, Secret Service uh, head of the detail, VP nominee detail, walked in the suite and uh, on the phone. And then Reagan later that night went and to the convention hall, gave a speech, and, um, and, and, and announced, announced, uh, announced uh, President Bush as the VP nominee. And they arranged to have breakfast the next morning, the, the Bushes and the, and the Reagans. And I remember going over to the, to the, 
uh, breakfast with him. The uh, vice president was uh, the, the, the VP, the, the soon to be VP nominee, and Mrs. Bush were very were quite nervous. They didn't know the Reagans very well. He he had just met him a few times when he was governor, and and. Um, uh, and and they had, and and like I said, there was it was a spirited it was a spirited uh, primary. But anyway, they were quite nervous. But I remember when Reagan opened the door to the suite, he big smile on his face with his arms out like this. I could tell that they both kind of relaxed. And then just the four of them had breakfast. And after the breakfast, uh, Presidents Reagan and Bush went down to give a, a, a have a press conference down on the mezzanine level and we went down in the service elevator and uh, and I remember on the way down President Bush made a comment about he looked at President Reagan and he said boy I, I kind of wish I was in dressed a little different maybe had a different tie or suit on and President Reagan who loved to tell jokes said well that reminds me of the um, the lady whose uh, husband had passed away and she went to the, the funeral home to see the um, see the president, uh, see, see her husband. And uh, the funeral director showed, showed her, her husband and, and she said, he looks great, he really looks good. Um, I, just one question, is there any way we might be able to change his suit? Uh, it, it, it put a, it put, I think he'd look better in gray instead of blue. And, and the funeral director thought for a second and picked up the phone and said, Charlie, can you, pick the, can you change the heads on 11 and 13? <laughs> and and uh, anyway. That's right. I know. I will. I will. I will. I will. Joe wanted me to tell that one. Uh, but anyway, they, they broke up. They broke up. Uh, it, it, President Bush loved a joke. He broke up laughing. They went down, did the press conference, and 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 it was. Um, and they had a and and they had great press conference. And it and, and anyway. And then that okay. night. That night. Um, uh, President Reagan gave his acceptance speech, and of course, as you know, at, at, after the acceptance, acceptance speech, the VP comes out to join him on the stage uh, first, and uh, they put their arms around each other and then hold their off arms up in the air. Well, VP nominee Bush kept kind of dropping his arm, and, um, and there was an aide to Reagan named Joe Canzeri, and we were kind of behind the podium. And he said, "You got to get out there and get him to get his arm, left arm up." And I, and I kind of laughed. I thought he was joking, and I kind of laughed. He said, "No, I'm seriously. You got to get. He's got to get his arm. You got to get his left arm up." Now, fortunately, there the podium had a uh, it was came up to about here on the on the candidate. So I I crawled out, <laughs> on I crawled out onto the stage, got his pant leg, and 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 went like this, and he did and. He, he, gave, he gave me a look of utter, uh, utter kind of uh, horror and dismay. But uh, anyway, he put up his left hand and, uh, and he never said anything. He never said anything else. He never said anything to me about it. But anyway, I know I went long on that, but it was a very interesting uh, convention. So, but um, anyway, so. But, Joe, you, you, there are so many wonderful essays in, in this book, but yours really stands out, at least in my mind. Tell us what you wrote about President well, thank Bush. thank you. Uh, Jean should probably read it. But... I'm not going to read it. Um, I, I can, read Joe's essay. Can, can I interrupt first and just tell you that the reason that I'm here tonight was not because I was in elevators with George Bush very often, um, or that I was by his side every minute from 1978 to 1993. But I'm here because Gene Becker said, you need to get David Bates up here from yeah. San Antonio. Yeah. Okay, that is not yeah. true. Joe's, I read Joe's essay at almost every book event I did, including at SMU last night. Just, it's an amazing essay. Am I to read it? Why don't you read, start, yeah. All right, so I... <laughs> Okay, my friends tease me that I've turned into Barbara Bush. I'm very bossy. Uh, I think the crowd understands that by yeah. now. <laughs> I was just going for a paraphrase. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> standings, the word okay, standings. This is from, this is from um, when I spent most of a week at the Bush School at A&M as the Cameron Fellow of the year, I guess about a year and a half ago. And... Um, so I used part of what I had to say there in this, in this essay that Gene used. And this is from um, his inaugural address. 
And I thought it was an important message that these students needed to have reinforced. But he knew that grace was not a sign of weakness. Standing on what he called the front porch of democracy, to give his inaugural address on January 20th, 1989, President Bush said, I take as my guide the hope of a saint in crucial things unity, in important things diversity, in all things generosity. And in a present era when partisanship has risen and tribalism has spread, there's a great impact in those three basic ideas. Unity, diversity, and generosity. Too often the way to get ahead in politics is by appealing to someone's worst instincts rather than their better angels. We've been conditioned to think that the path to power is through dividing and conquering. In contrast, President Bush built bipartisan coalitions around lasting achievements from the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act to Operation Desert Storm. When it comes to issues that really matter, you need people with different experiences and perspectives working together. No party has a monopoly on good ideas or on bad ones. And I can think of no better remedy to the tribalism in our politics today than the words President Bush spoke and the approach he embodied. He knew how to tap into our common goodness rather than trying to exploit our differences. Keep going? No, that's, that's <laughs> the best part. Yeah. There's much more, and the book is on sale. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great essay. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the, the essays in this book speak to so many different character traits. Generosity really stood out to me. Compassion really stood out to me. But the one I'd like to focus on first is maybe the strongest impression I came away with, and that is humility, which is not necessarily something that we expect of our political leaders, right? So I'd, I'd love to get each one of you to reflect on that quality of humility that President Bush seemed to so embody. But maybe you could address the question of how it was that this ever so humble man became president of the United States. It's not obvious that someone like this would achieve such, such great things. Um, Jean, why don't we go to you? Um, I have a theory, but I'm, I'm going to quote heavily from John Meacham, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian who wrote the definitive biography of President Bush, Destiny and Power. And he was one of his eulogists at his funeral. And John's theory on President Bush in general is, I think most of you know, he was shot down during World War II. He was, and his two crew members died. They were bombing the island of a radio tower on the island of Chichijima on September 2nd, 1944, and they got shot down. And President Bush survived. He got pulled out of the water by the USS Finback after about three hours. And he definitely had, for the rest of his life, survivor's guilt. And he, he and I talked about it a lot. And he, uh, there's a great essay from Neil Bush's daughter, Ashley, his granddaughter Ashley in the book, about he started talking to the family about it at Molina's restaurant one day over Tex-Mex food. But, but John Meacham's theory, and I think he's absolutely right, that President Bush was so humbled by the fact that he survived. And he spent the rest of his life wondering, why me? And, and John thinks that in many ways, President Bush lived the life of three people, his own and his two crew members. And he always felt responsible to give back. But I think, I think there's a lot of reasons why he was humble, but I think that could be one of the bigger reasons is that he survived that and it was a humbling experience for him. Fascinating. David, anything on humility? Um, yes, it, he, you know, he had, he certainly was had great humility, and and it really showed, I think, it, in the way he managed the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, when the Berlin Wall fell, he had many advisors, many on many in the media, many many on Capitol Hill. Who wanted him to go to the wall and and kind of and 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 basically cheerlead and um, 
and, and show some kind of American triumphalism. And um, he said, that's the last thing I should do. Um, Gorbachev is under great, he, he's under, he, he will be under great pressure uh, from the military to respond to this. And um, the last thing he needs is to have an American president over there beating his chest. And, um, and he, he um, and, and, I, and, and I think that just, um, he developed a, a, a real, real bond of trust with Gorbachev that um, continued, uh, continued after, after that fall of the Berlin Wall and, and really the peaceful fall of the Soviet Union, Bob Gates said it's really the only great empire in, in history that, that, um, that, that collapsed without, um, without, without, a, without a war in connection with it. And um, so. Speaker Strauss, David Bates raises a, a, an interesting point about the connections between these extraordinary character traits and the skills and ultimately the accomplishments that he achieved as president on humility or any other character trait you'd care to talk about, perhaps you could connect the character to the performance as president. Um, yeah, I think I think he he obviously was was a humble person who others would look to and say, why? How can this be? Look at all you've done and who you are and what you're. You know, you're the leader of the free world for God's sake. Why, how can you be so kind? And I think it's. I think it's because he had such a strong sense of empathy. He always cared so much about other people. And, you know, I, I um, didn't spend as much time with him as David did, but I knew him my whole life, really because of my, uh, the friendship that, that uh, Barbara and George Bush had with my parents, going back to the very early 60s and the early days of the Republican Party when all the Republicans in the state knew each other. <laughs> and that's really not, not an exaggeration. And, um, and so I was around him a lot um, over the years. And he was always the kindest man to kids. He, he took time always for everybody. Um, I can remember I did some advance, um, advance work for him when he was vice president during the midterms in 1982. And I did not get glamorous assignments. I had Roanoke, Virginia, <laughs> Jackson, Mississippi, El Paso, Texas was kind of fun. But anyway, there was there was. Um, oh, you're such a Texan. At every one of these, every, well, that's because he he um, insisted that I ride on Air Force Two back to San Antonio, which was a real thrill. Um, but at every every place he went, he took as much time for the people working an event as he did mm -hmm. for the people the event was honoring. And he wanted the names, as an advanced guy, he wanted the names of every single person who opened a door for him, every single motorcycle policeman, everybody. And he would write them, you know, short but personal notes, thanking them. And I'm, I'm convinced he became president because he thanked so many people. <laughs> and, 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 and they were all sincere. I, I did a, um, a class at Trinity University the morning after the election a couple of weeks ago. And I talked about how he did this. And one of the students said, oh my gosh, that's amazing. My father was a pilot and he flew um, President Bush, before he was president, campaigning somewhere for something, and we have framed on our wall the letter that he wrote my father. So I think, I think it was um, just caring so much about other people, thanking them, full of gratitude, humility, all of it wrapped in one really unique package. Can I tell a wackadoodle story? Please. I mean, I've already told you about George Clooney and me doing this, so. Uh, so we're in Kennebunk Port, and to make a long story short, I had to have emergency surgery. It's sort of embarrassing. I had a tumor the size of a volleyball, in which I hadn't noticed. It was benign. Um, but I went in through the emergency room um, and had it removed. It was a long, complicated surgery. And I finally come out of my 
you know, wake up for the first time and who's sitting in my room but George Herbert Walker Bush. I immediately pushed the morphine button. <laughs> and the first thing he said to me was, he said that Mrs. Bush was not with him. She wanted to come later so we could have girl talk. So he said, I came by myself. And the surgeon comes in with about 10 residents. And they, you know, I came in through the emergency room. They had no idea who I worked for. So you can imagine the look on my surgeon's face when he walks in, and there's George Herbert Walker Bush sitting there. <laughs> and the surgeon very politely said, hello, Mr. <laughs> President. He said, I need for you to ask the room, leave the room because I need to talk to Jean about her surgery. And, you know, this confidential. And he said, oh, she'll want me here. She, she won't care. And I, morphine, morphine. So this is, this is TMI, but you have to know this part. What sent me to the emergency room, I'd not been feeling well for a couple of days. All of my body functions shut down, all of them. And after about two days, I thought, hmm, I better go to the hospital. <laughs> and the doctor was explaining this to the residents, why, you know, teaching them. And President Bush looked at me and said, number one or number two? <laughs> <laughs> morphine, morphine. <laughs> why am I telling you? Oh, then he wanted to see the tumor. He said, Gene, I, I would like to see that tumor. And the doctor said, he looked at me and, and he, they had already uh, bisected it to, and it was benign and all that. The only reason I tell you this story, it is a classic George Bush story. He cared so much about everything and everybody. And he was interested in your life, your family and my tumor. <laughs> and, uh, but it was just so classic him. And I was higher than a kite by the time he left because I had pretty well drained my morphine bottle. But his visit, it, the story's actually in the book. My, it's in both of my books. My editor loves that story. Yeah, no. uh, but it just shows his character. That capacity for emotional connection yes, is yes. something that really jumped out at me. My favorite little nugget in the book was, I think it's from the run-up to one of George W. Bush's inaugurations, which led George H.W. Bush, apparently, to write to his doctor to ask if there was anything he could take to prevent him from crying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, he didn't yeah. want to cry. <laughs> you know, I don't think this is in the book. It's in The Man I Knew. But the night the Supreme Court ruled on the Florida, uh, the, the, the ruling that made George W. president, and ruled against Al Gore and ruled in favor of George W. President Bush called me at home and he said, I would like to call, well, it was, I don't know if it was that night or the next night that Vice President Gore gave his concession speech, speech. And it was very gracious. And President Bush, it might've been the next night, and President Bush called me and he said, can you get Al Gore on the phone for me? And I said, why do you want to call the vice president? He says, I want to call and thank him for that speech because it was so gracious and I just would like to call him. And I, and I said to him, I said, sir, I'm not sure you're the person that Vice President Gore wants to hear from tonight. And he said, I have been where he is. I know what it feels like to lose. And I want to call and tell him that and just thank him. And I said, well, let me, I can, I'll get him through the, we'll use the White House operator. And he said, oh, I didn't need you to begin with. And he hung up on me. <laughs> and <laughs> so I'm watching on television and I'm literally, the Vice President Gore comes out of the old executive office building. I see him get in his limo. And as soon as he gets in his limo, I see him pick up the phone. And I'm thinking, surely not. Five minutes later, President Bush called me, had a great call with Al, and he was really <laughs> grateful that I called. But you know what, what a, and, and Vice President Gore talked about that call. That was so, here's his son had just become president of the, president elect of the United States. He was thinking of Al Gore. It's just, you know, he was something.
So this, yeah. this is a book about George Herbert Walker Bush, and yet it is impossible, of course, to read this book right now and not reflect on our current political moment. And, and in places in the book, Gene, you invite us to reflect in exactly that way. You say um, at one point in the book, this book is about what we can learn from him, President Bush, that maybe can help our nation's leaders get to a better place, actually help all of us get to a better place. So I want to ask you, of course, a couple of questions about how we might think about President Bush in the context of our, of our own day. And I think the place to start here is just to ask a really simple question. Why does it matter that our leaders have the kind of character that you tease out of President start. Bush's life. Why don't you start? Um, well, first, I want to, before I forget, I want to um, point out that the tie that I'm wearing tonight was one of George Bush's ties. Did you steal it from him? I, <laughs> you, you may have stolen it because I got it from you. Oh, I gave but, it to you. But also, <laughs> I, I know it's authentic because it has nice. a soup stain on it. And, and it's not broccoli. Um, whatever your question was, I think that, I think, um, you know, we're, we're just at such an unhappy time. And it's one that I know isn't brand new. We've been here for a while. Even, even when um, President Bush was still alive, I can remember being um, at lunch with you all one day in Houston. And um, he was pretty, pretty upset about the way things were going. This was in 2016, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, seemed, seemed sad, genuinely, <clears throat> genuinely sad about the way things were, were going in the country. I can remember also Bob Dole called during okay. lunch. And that was a bitch session, I can tell you. <laughs> um, but I think, I, you know, I think we should all thank those of us who lived in George Bush 41 world and revere him the way that a lot of us do, um, that we should be thanking Gene for keeping that flame alive oh. and keeping Absolutely. the stories and the legacy that truly belongs to George Herbert Walker Bush going for future generations because it's been a long time in this country since we've really been in, an, in a time when our leaders seem decent. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, books like yours and stories that are being told still um, will resonate, and young people hopefully will come along and say, what's the matter with all you people? This isn't the way we should be doing things, and, and, it, and government and, and the world can work so much better if we can remember, you know, the, the famous phrase that he used, kinder, gentler. Mm -hmm. And I, I really believe we're going to get back to that, but I think it's also very helpful, Gene, that you keep telling these stories and, and keeping his legacy alive. Thank you. Thank David, you. what do you think? What, what are... <laughs> yeah. What does President Bush's life have to teach us that we would do well to learn in our own moment? Well, I think he... We, we have some serious problems that, that have to be addressed domestically and internationally. One thing President Bush, he, he was... Um, such a honest man, such a such a person of great integrity. Um, he he engendered trust among those that he dealt with, either you know members of Congress, members of the opposing party, world leaders. He was a person of his word. I mean, you could if he told you he was going to do something, you could count on it. And I think that that um, we we really do need to address these these serious you know, structural problems domestically and, and, and we, we, we need to do, we need to, we have, we have problems on the international stage and I think, as Joe said, we're going to, 
we're going to need people in, in our, to lead our country again with those characteristics of, you know, just of, of great character and great integrity and uh, to, to, solve, to solve the problems domestically and internationally. Gene, I want to hear from you as well on this question. What is it that we would do well to learn from President <clears throat> Bush in our own moment? What, what's amazing about Character Matters is the book came out in April, and I'm still doing a full-fledged book tour. My editor is shocked. This book should have faded away. <laughs> Several months ago, I'm speaking on a lot of college campuses, did a high school assembly in Houston, um, and I would love to think it's all about me. No, it's all about him. <laughs> it's all about George Herbert Walker Bush. People are just wanting words of encouragement and, and a sense of optimism. And one of the things I say to people is learn from him, learn how the, re, the 1990 budget deal is just a great example where he compromised with the Democrats, raised taxes, and wrote in his diary, I probably just made myself a one-term president, but it was, that's what was right for America. How many of the 535 members of Congress right now would write that in their diary right now? <laughs> not a lot. Not to be difficult, but not a lot. And, and so you can learn a lot from him, but I think the big challenge is the voters. We need to hold our elected officials to a higher standard. We cannot put up with them lying. <laughs> You know, we, it's, it's up to us. With all due respect to, you know, blaming the media and blaming this and that, the voters are the one who vote. So we need to hold our leaders to a higher standard. And if writing this book helps even a little bit, then I will be so happy. <laughs> I love the, fi the very final words of the book, in your acknowledgments, in fact are we need his voice more than ever, a kinder and gentler reminder that yes, character really does matter. Let's go out there and make him proud. You've just given us a, an answer, what we can all do to go out there and make him proud. There may be other things to say, but I'd love to hear Speaker Strauss, David Bates on that, that question. What can we all do to live up to what President Bush embodied that would make him proud? Exactly what, what Gene said. You know, as, as George Bush would say, get in the game. Yeah. And, um, you know, don't, don't let people tell you that just because things are the way they are, that's the way they're always going to be. I used to, keep a, I used to keep a photo of a family visit to Washington, D.C. in 1969 when he was a congressman. And we spent time with him. And it was a photo of my family with him in the Capitol. And, and, and other photos of him, too, I would keep nearby. When there were people in office in Austin, state politics, state government, who would try to intimidate and bully and try to do the wrong thing, and I would always look at those photos. And I'm not going to name names, but there were people higher up on the organization chart than me trying to push me into doing things. And I would always just look at the photo of George Bush and say, I've known him all my life. He was a stand-up guy of character. These other people don't measure up to him. I'm going to tune him out. Um, so I just think we all need to get in the game, do what Gene said and participate, vote, get our friends to vote, particularly in primaries where a lot of these problems are occurring. and. Um, just don't take the status quo as an answer. David, your thoughts. Yeah, what can I, we all do? yeah, I, I, I agree. Just yeah, get in the game and uh, and just try try our best to emulate emulate uh, emulate all he did, um, personally and professionally, and and um, all his great attributes and characteristics, as best we can. So he. It, um, no human's perfect, but he was about as close to being perfect as anybody, any, any, any human I've ever met, so, yeah. I appreciated Speaker Strauss's words of optimism about the possibility we might yet get back to that space. Um, perhaps you have more to add to that, Gene, and David, I'd love no, to hear your thoughts that, on that. 
How many people have you met recently, or even in the last 10 years, who say, everything's great. I love, I love the way things are happening in our country. <laughs> I mean, are we going to do this forever? I don't think so. Yeah. We've gotten grumpy. Yeah. yeah. It's your influence. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think, David? Can we, well, get, can we get back to that space? I certainly hope so. I think, I think, as a, I think really it's going to become a matter of necessity to, that, that we're going to need a great man and a great man of a character to, to, woman. to or, or woman. Thank yes, you. yes, and indeed, yes, indeed. Uh, 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 yes, indeed. To, 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 uh, to, to lead, the, lead the country again. And, and, um, um, and, and address these, these issues that I, I've I talked know, about. I think I know what President Bush would say if he were here. And I, I've been quoting him a lot in the last couple of months. Uh, after 9-11, there was a group of people who were visiting with him, and they were being young families, young parents, and one in particular was being very negative and said, our world is turned upside down. We will never be the same again. The world as we know it is over. And she said to President Bush, you have no idea how hard it is to be a parent right now. You have no idea. You have no idea what we're going through with our children. They're terrified. And I watched President Bush count to 10. And then he talked about World War II, when the entire world was at war. He talked about the Cold War where we used to practice hiding under our desk at school in case a nuclear bomb came. He talked at length about the 60s. And he said, I raised my children in the 60s. Three huge assassinations, the Vietnam War, the 60s were a mess. No one knows that better than the man who this library is named for. The 60s was one of our most complicated decades. And President Bush told this group, he said, the only reason I'm not bringing up the Civil War is because I wasn't <laughs> alive then. But his whole point was, we'll get through this. Yeah. We can do this. We got to work at it. We got to figure out why 9-11 happened. I know that he would be optimistic if he were here. But like you all said, he would say, get engaged, get in the game, but we will get through this. And I know that he, he it was a big believer in our country and in our constitution and our democracy. I promised to give the final word to you, Jean. You um, had uh, a selection from the book, I think, that you thought would be a particularly appropriate place for us to yeah. end on. I think we do. Yeah. So the whole, this whole book is a series of essays written by other people except for one chapter. It's all his voice. It's speeches, essays, letters, diary entries. And particularly now, I think it's appropriate to read his address, his radio address to the nation after he lost to Bill Clinton. This is a Saturday. This is November 7th, 1992, the Saturday after he lost the election. This is what he said to the country. Way back in 1945, Winston Churchill was defeated at the polls. He said, I've been given the order of the boot. <laughs> that is the exact same position in which I find myself today. I admit this is not the position I would have preferred, but it is a judgment I honor. Having known the sweet taste of popular favor, I can more readily accept the sour taste of defeat because it is seasoned for me by my deep devotion to the political system under which this nation has thrived for two centuries. Ours is a nation that has shed the blood of war and cried the tears of depression. We have stretched the limits of human imagination and seen the technologically miraculous become almost mundane. Always, always our advantage has been our spirit, a constant confidence, a sense that in America, the only things not yet accomplished are the things that have not yet been tried. President Clinton, President-elect Clinton needs all Americans to unite behind him so he can move our nation forward. But more than that, he will need to draw upon this unique American spirit. There are no magic outside solutions to our problems. The real answers lie within us. 
We need more than a philosophy of entitlement. We need to all pitch in, lend a hand, and do our part to help forge a brighter future for this country. On January 20th, Barbara and I will head back to Texas. For us, there will be no more elections and no more politics. That didn't really work out that well, but, <laughs> but we will rededicate ourselves to serving others because after all, that is the secret of this unique American spirit. With this spirit, we can realize the golden opportunities before us and make sure that our new day, like every American day, is filled with hope and promise. Well, very fitting end, words to end on, but I will uh, simply add congratulations on this wonderful book, which I've truly enjoyed reading over the last couple of I have weeks. 154 co-authors. That's, and, and, and including these two, Mark Uptergrove has an essay exactly. in the book. Uh, and lots of copies outside for yeah, sale, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean Becker, for being here. Thank you for being here, uh, former Speaker Strauss, David Bates, wonderful to have you. Really appreciate all your time and insights. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.